helping us examine all the latest headlines on COVID-19. We're joined now, as we often are, by Dr. Isaac Bogosh. He's an infectious disease specialist at Toronto General Hospital and someone that we have been turning for answers throughout all this, and we reached him at the hospital now. Doctor, thanks again for joining us, as always. Uh, We've been talking in our editorial meetings about a few issues that seem to be swirling around out there in terms of the stories that we hear and what it might mean, because there are so many uh, unknowns still around all this. But let's talk about this, why this seems to affect some people much differently than others. Pre-existing conditions, that's one thing. But even beyond that, different age groups, different uh, length of infections, uh, catastrophic drops in condition and then bounce backs. Can we read anything into the, the seeming inconsistency of the way this disease affects people? Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is the million dollar question because we know, as you point out, there's some very common and, and better understood risk factors. You know, people who have underlying medical conditions, people who are over the age of 60 and especially over the age of, uh, of 80, we know that these individuals are more prone to having a severe outcome with this infection. But of course, that's not the, that, there's much more to it than that. And uh, we certainly see some younger people who are having severe infections. Fortunately, that's rare, it, but of course it does happen. And of course, we see some elderly people who get this infection and, and recover from it. So there's clearly some other factors that are, are uh, at play here. A lot of this has to do with how the virus really interacts with a host, with a person's immune system. And the nature of that interaction will really uh, determine their clinical course. And, you know, if you have too little of an immune reaction or too much of an immune reaction, you're likely more prone to have a severe outcome. You have to have that right balance. Now, the question is, how do you predict that? And, and you, you really can't based on what we have available right now. There's some amazing teams, though, that are doing some research looking at what we call biomarkers. So can you do a blood test? to look for some molecule in the blood that will really predict who is gonna take a more severe turn and who is gonna have a much more mild course of illness. And this is a very active area of research right now. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, one of those anomalies or a series of anomalies around uh, the recovery or uh, around the infection rate could maybe provide a key to understanding uh, treatment and predicting this down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Essentially, I think a lot of it comes down to the person's immune system, and a lot of that's determined by an individual's genetics. And uh, and and some people are going to have a rougher go at this, and other people are going to have a much more mild course of illness. Of course, beyond traditional risk factors that we're we're well aware of, you know, so scientists and, and researchers are really looking to find markers that are available in people. So either genetic markers or uh, what we call biomarkers, things that are chemicals that are available and detectable in the blood that will help predict who will take what course. And also this might be helpful to determine our, our understanding of this infection. And, and I would even broaden this to other infections. I mean, a lot of this work is being done in uh, sepsis research, in influenza research, in malaria research. So, you know, this is really uh, a, a major focus of research right now to determine who gets sick and who doesn't beyond traditional risk factors. Something else that has made some headlines uh, in recent days has been this possibility of reinfection, that people who have had it and have recovered and then have effectively uh, tested positive, and, and that's the question, is that just testing positive for antibodies showing that they've had it, or could it imply that one could become reinfected? For example, like malaria comes back and back and back, if not carefully and, and properly dealt with. Yeah, exactly, I mean, I really, I have a few thoughts on this. One is that, of course, we still have to be open-minded, and we'd be foolish to think that we, we know everything about this disease. I'm really hesitant to think about reinfection in this, but of course I'm open-minded to the thought. I know that many people who have this infection get, for example, what's called a, a, a nasopharyngeal swab, where you take a big swab, you stick it far, far back into the back of the nose, and you do a certain test. It's called PCR. It's just a, it's a diagnostic test. This is what we're using all throughout Canada to determine if someone has this infection or not. If that test is positive, yeah, you, more, you got this infection, and then, uh, and then, you know, thankfully, most people recover and do well. And of course, sadly, we know that some people succumb to this illness. But let's say someone recovers from this illness, Many people uh, feel well, they, they recover, they're doing okay, 
And if they have another test done for whatever reason, sometimes that test lingers around. And sometimes that PCR test can still be positive uh, even after you've recovered. And it can be positive for a period of time. Different infection, but kind of related to this, we saw this happen with Zika virus. And if people remember a couple of years ago, there was some issue with Zika virus positivity in many people long after they've recovered from the infection. And those people not only didn't have Zika virus anymore, but they weren't even contagious. So this is not a new phenomenon in infectious diseases. We've known about this for a while. It may be happening here with uh, COVID-19. The question is though, you know, obviously this warrants further investigation. Obviously we need to look more into this to see, are people truly becoming immune to this infection? If so, for how long? So what is the duration of immunity? And, um, and of course, you know, can people truly be reinfected with this virus? I still think those are important questions to answer, but you know, I wanna see some data before we start to really talk about people truly getting reinfected. Dr. Bogash, thank you. As always, we'll be talking to you again, but for now, thank you for your time. Take care. Dr. Isaac Bogash is an infectious disease specialist at Toronto General Hospital.